first things first, I just want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, it's our pleasure to have this discussion with you today. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Myers, Chief of Glaucoma Service of Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. Dr. Myers has authored and co-authored more than 90 articles in peer-reviewed journals and has lectured internationally regarding the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma. Monica Fisher is also joining us. She is the Senior Marketing Manager of Perimetry at Hogstrite. She is one of the authors of the Visual Field Digest, the Guide to Perimetry and the Octopus Perimeter. Monica has been an employee of Hogstrite Diagnostics for seven years. Uh, I'm Tanya Lay. I'm the Director of Sales and Product Marketing for Lenstar and Octopus Product in the United States, and I've been working for Hogstrite for five years. One of the things that we would like to discuss on this phone call today is just the risk of cross-infection with cupula per perimeters. So Dr. Myers, I just kind of wanted to ask you, what is the real concern here with COVID-19 transmission with regards to cupula per perimeters? Um, thanks for asking. I'm happy to have a chance to talk about that. So, you know, we're, we live in a, a new era, uh, unknown to all of us before, the COVID era. And uh, pretty much from the beginning, there's been a concern with COVID about aerosol, aerosolization of the virus within uh, uh, droplets of moisture, very small droplets. And you can see this, just a small sampling that two minutes on PubMed will find you. Uh, to call out this particular, you can't see me gesturing, but to call out the aerodynamic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 in two Wuhan hospitals, they showed that aerosolized particles were identified just, you know, in the laboratory, actually in an active patient ward. So we worry, or at least the, the fear has been brought up that as patients are taking open bowl perimetry, that there's the possibility that an asymptomatic patient might contaminate the air within the bowl. And that could be a possible transmission route, although I should mention that no one has shown this to actually occur. There have been no cases reported, and it may be that we're too sensitive about this. But it has been shown that the virus can be found on plastics and glass and still be viable four and five days after it's uh, deposited there. And so I think the concerns should be taken seriously. Fortunately, a number of, uh, a number of things can be used to disinfect these surfaces, such as uh, ethanol and other alcohols, as well as frankly, just washing with soap and water. So the virus can be cleared and deactivated easily. At the same time, perimeters were not uh, meant to go through the uh, washer and dryer, so that has raised questions. Yeah. So, what kind of evidence do we have regarding uh, COVID-19 transmission? So, uh, um, there's good evidence that it can be transmitted by aerosolized particles. However, it also can be transmitted by people touching surfaces with their hands, and then touching, of course, their mouth and eyes. And uh, in particular, the mouth and nose, uh, direct contact is how a lot of other viruses, everyone's familiar with influenza A and influenza B are often transmitted. So we're not actually sure how important the aerosol route is, but until we know more, we're trying to take lots of precautions. And so, I understand that we really need to aim here for a safe solution. Uh, how do we continue? So I've heard that a lot of people are deferring uh, visual field testing. So Dr. Myers, can you tell me why is it important to start testing again? Well, you know, so patients and physicians actually have become a little bit concerned about some of these contact and uh, aerosol potential uh, contaminations through field testing. But when you look at the most recent, uh, most important studies that have been published, such as the UK GTS, they had, when they planned this study, all the options open to them, spectral domain OCT, perimetry, and they chose perimetry as their primary outcome. And these are the, pretty much the best and the brightest uh, that international glaucoma has to offer. And their thinking was that perimetry is absolutely critical in the management of glaucoma. 
and it's absolutely central to our patients and their quality of life and their sight. It's the direct functional measure. So even though spectrum domain OCT is absolutely critical to the management of glaucoma, in the end, it's actually people's sight that we care most about. So this, this shying away of perimetry has the potential to uh, leave us in the dark as to whether our patients are losing more sight. And, and that's obviously very concerning. Sure. And I realize that there isn't necessarily a uh, perfect solution here for disinfecting the inside of the uh, bowl or cupula perimeters, whether it be Octopus or some other brand. Um, Monica, would you like to share information regarding how to properly disinfect um, at least our hog stripe perimeter? Yes, absolutely. And you, you're pointing to a really important point, Tonya, um, that I think prior to this epidemic, I think the widespread thinking of the whole industry and also the regulatory agencies uh, was that the inside of a cupola is a non-contact -surf, non surface, so that it doesn't necessarily have to be um, disinfectable. Um, and so if you look at older manuals, then it clearly says don't touch this because there's a risk of damaging uh, electronics if you come off um, a wet um, ingredient or there's a risk of the damage of the surface or staining the surface, which will have an influence on the result. Um, of course, now as a response to it, and we at Harkstray have been taking this very seriously, we've been really looking for a solution on how to disinfect the cupola or the whole perimeter without, put, without actually damaging it. I think that's the huge challenge. Um, so first, easy things first. Um, the outside, you can just wipe with alcohol wipes head, chin rest, uh, don't, don't need to be careful. There's no electronic part. This is really safe because this has been designed to be safe uh, for cleaning. Also trial lenses, um, make sure to disinfect, um, you know, just everything in contact with anybody. Um, the inside of the cupola, we really advise to be really careful. Um, so if just dust, um, I mean, first remove any dirt or dust with a lint-free cloth. Um, if there are stains, I mean, if somebody has coughed and um, try metal soap to really get this and wipe it off with, with um, lint-free cloth. Um, but when it comes to disinfection, um, what we found is the least damaging agent is really if you spray the whole cupola with an atomizer, uh, either isopropanol or ethanol. Um, and then don't touch it, don't rub it, just let it dry. Because if you touch it, there's always a risk, right? That you may scratch it or you may stain it. Um, so really be careful, remove, if you ever have a stain and you need to touch the inside of the cupola, remove jewelry or anything that could be scratching. Um, and when you spray, be really careful to wet, but don't, don't put in droplets or something because that potentially, you know, could go somewhere and damage the electronics. So, so it, it's really all about like a little bit of moisture, but not too much um, to do that. And this is all part of a manual that we're releasing this week. Uh, so this is a safe procedure, but Dr. Myers, from a practical point of view, what do you think? Um. So the question is, uh, in part, how often one can practically do this, to do a full wipe down between each patient or even spray down and allow to dry would slow the use of these machines quite a lot, uh, whoever's machine it is. Um, so I think it's something that we're going to do and consider, but uh, raises challenges in terms of the workflow of their typical ophthalmology office. So if I may interrupt just a moment here, we have a few questions that have been coming through and a couple comments here leading into some of our next discussions here. Um, an attendee asked, what if a patient is wearing a mask during taking the test? So that was kind of my next point is uh, your suggestion for, you know, should we recommend that patients wear a mask during these tests? So uh, where we are right now, in my office and Will's Eye Hospital, in order to get in the door, you have to wear a mask. And while in Will's Eye Hospital, you have to keep the mask on, whether you're patient, staff, uh, any worker, everyone has to wear it, visitors. 
So everyone who's taking a field test is wearing a mask. Um, that probably reduces but not eliminate, uh, it does not fully eliminate the question of aerosol spread in this great slide prepared by Monica. It shows what some of our patients have experienced wearing masks, their glasses or the lenses of some perimeters, the trial lenses may uh, become fogged. Um, so that's an issue. And of course, the mask itself, if it's riding up too high, can create various uh, artifacts on perimetry as well or distractions for the patient. So I think masks can help. Uh, I don't think it's a perfect solution. And I think it raises other challenges that we have to address as well and be very cognizant of. Right, and I think, I mean, what we can definitely make, do, I mean, we looked a bit at the fogging on what can you do. Um, and obviously a mask with um, a metal wiring that can really be molded perfectly um, to patient's face, that's helping. It also helps reducing, um, reduce field of view. Um, then I think yesterday when we discussed that, Dr. Barry said that we can put the tissue on, on the top just to prevent the breath going up um, and sort of going down and if, all things fail, I mean, we could potentially tape, put a tape there and, um, so that the breath's not coming up to fog the glass. But of course, that's not very practical either. Yes, this is really a new skill set for us instructing patients and patients have some interesting habits themselves. Uh, I've now seen many patients who wear the mask and then they, when they wish to speak to me, pull the mask down. Um, so uh, there's some education and feedback we need to give people on, on how these things are supposed to function, uh, even aside from perimetry. Yeah, so one other thing that I wanted to clarify, um, because it's a question on here regarding um, an end user has a 740i, and how does this differ from what we are describing? So I'd like to say that it's very similar. Um, this applies to any perimeter that is a bowl or cupola perimeter. So the same difficulties will arise with any bowl or cupola perimeter. Just maybe adding to that, um, Tonya, uh, totally correct. I think the, it, it's not that uh, Hoxray has not done his job and everyone else has. I think it's a, just a general issue where even regulatory bodies are very concerned always um, and have the patient safety at their first, um, point in mind, um, we did not consider that as a risk. Um, when it comes to the detailed cleaning instructions, um, the seventh, um, Casales has released um, a cleaning and disinfection um, manual, which is fairly similar, but um, has some points that are different, like something like you have to um, cover some parts, which are special sensitive. Um, we checked on this on the on the octopus perimeter, and we really saw no need to cover a chin rest while you're spraying, because um, there's no no sensitive electronic there that you could damage. Um, same thing for um, for the mirrors or the infrared lights, um, and the trial lenses are made of glass, so you can really freely wipe them as you as often as you want, um, and not at risk. So yeah, similar issue, um, slightly differences in the solution. Yeah. So I was just going to say one other question that came up is um, if the virus is deposited on the surface um, and it's no longer aerosolized, why do we care? Um, and the answer is we may not need to care, we don't know, but I would just point out that that study of aerosolized uh, virus particles in the two hospitals in Wuhan uh, they were concerned that actually some of the particles they detected were the uh, disbursement of prior particles that had been deposited on surfaces. And, and the reason they thought that was because some of the particles were of larger size in a way that, to the researchers' uh, way of thinking, meant that they had been redistributed after being deposited. So that, that's why the concern about wiping down uh, surfaces that may not uh, be in direct contact. Yeah, this, this leads me to a, a really great point as you know, we've talked about masks, we've talked about cleaning, we've talked about disinfecting, but um, you know, are there other solutions? So I think Hogstrite offers a really fantastic alternative 
And I would like you to, to share your perspective um, on, you know, our enclosed Octopus 600 device that we offer. So, so we have here a picture of the 600 on the left and then other screen-based perimeters as opposed to bowl-based perimeters. Some of these screen-based perimeters are, are really just screening devices. They don't have progression algorithms. They're meant to be easily portable devices that you take out in the community, which can be very helpful. The, the 600 though is a full featured uh, perimetry device with progression and the normal algorithms that we use all the time with our bowl based perimeters uh, to do standard achromatic perimetry. Um, although you can do tablet based perimetry and internet based perimetry, there are a lot of practical issues regarding standardization of both the light, the lighting around the patient, as well as the lighting from the tablet itself and the distance from the patient that makes these things less well suited for watching for progressive disease. So again, the, the 600 is shown on the left, uh, we found to be very useful for full, for full perimetry analysis. Maybe let me give you a quick overview of the features of the 600. Uh, as Dr. May said, uh, this is not just a screener. It, it does have a screening functionality, the pulsar stimulus and the sh very short screening test, but else it's just a normal white on white perimeter. It's just screen based. Um, and it's really meeting the highest quality standards with a fully calibrated industrial screen. So this is a full equivalent. It does white and white perimetry for 30 degrees. It does all the standard test patterns, the GE, RM, um, 30 2, 24 2, 10 2. That's a full threshold, either with the faster top strategy that just takes two and a half minutes or a bit more for a dynamic strategy. And I think I think the one thing that really sets this apart from other screen-based perimeters, it comes really with the exact same software as the Octopus 900 cupola perimeter. It gives the same reports, it gives the same progression. Um, and we do have a lot of ophthalmologists actually using this as their primary device across the world. Um, because it's also besides um, all the functionality, um, it has really a small footprint, so that's nice. Um, makes it portable too. Um, and one huge advantage is you don't need a dark room. And I think um, at, in our current times, there's actually an advantage that you don't need to go to this really small and close dark room that we often use for perimetry, right? Uh, where you get a bit of higher air concentration or, or you can't kind of ventilate the areas as easily as a larger room. Um, and just getting to the fogging, um, the, you see here at the bottom, um, <clears throat> the patient interface where the fixation is really on a headrest and the trial lenses are actually coming with the device and are much larger. So as a result, you're further away from them. And that really puts the risk of fogging down to, one. not saying zero, but makes it very low. I mean, Dr. Myers, you've been using this for, for quite some years. Um, and you've trusted the fog in. Did you experience any of that? Yeah, we, we've been using this for about a half dozen years. Um, we got it. We actually started using it because we had a CDC, uh, that's the U.S. Uh, Centers for Disease Control, um, funded study outreach into the community where we went every month to 50 different community centers, churches, and the like throughout the Philadelphia area to reach out to underserved people and we, we would test them and then we test them. And so we did, we used this as a full function machine and found it easy to use. Since switching it now to be used for patients during COVID, uh, we have not yet had problems with people fogging up because it seems like that distance is just a little greater uh, and the those uh, trial lenses are, are much larger, the built-in lenses there and so, Knock wood, it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue for us, but I'm sure it will come up in various ways because there's always a patient that has uh, any problem one can imagine, but at least less of an issue. Sure. And I, I'd also like to touch, Monica, if you don't mind, on um, some of the limitations that the Octopus 600 has, you know, as, as it relates to kinetic fields and, and that type of thing. Do you mind touching on that for a moment? Uh, Sure, it's a very important um, point, of course, to be aware of what you get and what you don't get. 
um, because this is a screen-based parameter, you know, the screen is flat, so there's the limit when it comes uh, to going to larger degrees out. So this is a 30 degree device. So it, it, as I said, it does all the routine glaucoma testing, macular testing, uh, but it doesn't do a full field. So any driving test, social security tests, or if you wanna check ptosis on a full field and not just on a free dash two, uh, it really does not offer, doesn't, and it, it neither do, offers uh, Goldman kinetic fields. I think why we're presenting this here also as an alternative is that the bulk of visual field testing is within the 30 degrees and that this device actually does it. And getting back to your point, Dr. Myers, um, on the spraying being quite impractical to do be um, between every patient. So if we can, you know, use the cupola parameters less frequently, I think that'd be helpful. Yes. Oh yeah, I agree. The, uh, again, just trying to make it easy for all of us to try to resume uh, as normal as we can practice. Obviously, there's a large body of patients out there that we still need to keep track of, and it's going to be a challenge given the other constraints already upon us to make sure patients are protected in every way we can imagine. Now, the really, yeah, I think that's why we're presenting because you can really wipe it, even the trial lenses. Um, we had a discussion yesterday whether they're out of, you know, not, not made of glass and we have to be careful, but these are actually made of glass and we manufacture them here in Switzerland. So you can really wipe them after every patient, which we highly recommend you to do. Now, the other really nice thing about uh, this Octopus 600 and of course other products within Hog Stride is that you're able to transfer the majority of your patient data just depending upon you know, the type of device that you have, you know, there are, there are some limitations um, also with functionality, whether the, the device is still currently working or not. Um, but, you know, what is the best way you think to integrate an Octopus 600 into a, a practice, whether it be an Octopus 900 or it be a Humphrey? Um. Shall I answer that? Um, maybe let me start from the you pure. Start, I'll add on. That's great. Yeah, so I started on the pure boring specification point of view, and then you add uh, the clinical perspective to this. Um, so, from a pure technical point of view, an Octopus 600. If, if you're an Octopus user and already have um, an Octopus 900, your Octopus 600 just goes into your same database. So, both devices run on the same iSuite software. So, basically. Uh, all your data, feed, I mean, you, you're using a joint database if you network this. Um, so you can just follow your patients and transfer them over to a 600 um, and you will see the data in the same trend line. So this is absolutely no concern. Um, just keep working the way you work. Um, for users of a Humphrey perimeter, um, there are two options. One is uh, we have the possibility to import all the Humphrey data as a raw data, not as a report. So we can actually recalculate and, pu um, and put it in a trend lines and kind of, you know, just keep you following these patients up in the iSuite software. That's one option. The other options is uh, if Forum is your dominant device, um, the Octopus 600 can create a report and send that out to Forum, be looked at there. So if these are the two options. Um, Jonathan, what's your practical experience of integration? So we, we, we've made our major switch from Humphrey and CETA to Octopus in 2009. Um, at that point, we had somewhere about 140,000 visual fields that we transferred from the Humphrey database into an Octopus database. And that allowed us to look at the old tests next to the new test very easily in the software that we'll, I know we're going to be talking about a little bit, the iSuite. Um, from our standpoint, it was, you know, a very easy transition once we learned uh, the features of the machines. Uh, one of the big features is just understanding the different terms that we use to talk about octopus fields versus Humphreys. They're directly analogous, but we use slightly different terms. But the transfer worked very easily, and, and this is the first, you know, at the time I was looking at paper fields, I was looking at fields that had been scanned into the computer, and this was the first machine and software that I really felt made my life easier rather than making it harder in an EMR environment. So it was huge for us. 
That's great. So can you touch a little bit on also um, introducing any kind of variability when you talk about switching devices like you did? Could you elaborate a bit on that? Well, so it's interesting because, you know, no two visual field machines that are different makes or models are doing exactly the same tests, but they're doing highly analogous tests. And, and these two examples that Monica was kind enough to dig out, the one on the left from an, uh, a prior style octopus to the newer octopus, the one on the right, one of my patients when they switched in 2009 from Humphrey to Octopus 900, you can see that the variability of the patient themselves in most cases is going to be greater than the variability between the different testing algorithms because the testing algorithms, as Monica will talk about a little bit more, are already looking at data that's compared to nor the normative database. So you're not looking just at raw data. And, and that means that, again, these, these results are highly comparable. And as you can see here, when you look at that junction in 2009 and you look at the two Humphrey fields before and the two octopus fields after this transition, uh, they are extremely similar. And although there were exceptions to that rule, most patients, things were very, very similar. In the cases where things were not similar, we did extra fields, both to help facilitate the patient's learning curve and also to make sure we had a really good baseline for the new octopus so we knew exactly where the patient was starting. And as you know, in the new protocols used in uh, studies now, they often do two or often three baseline fields and at each time point to really see if there's change. So that if you're not certain, it's easy to just get a couple extra fields the next few visits. And maybe if I may add to that, uh, Jonathan, on, on the transition and the learning, um, what we, we often involved in transition cases when there's a concern about you know, the new device, and it, it kind of turns out that any new device uh, can be a concern. And when we looked at this really carefully, what we found is that some patients do experience a personal learning curve when switching from device A to device B, and it really doesn't matter what they switch from and where they end up with. Um, and what we found was just a really good way of near, you know, kind of um, re strongly reducing the problem is, um, we have the technicians taking the test with the new device and kind of them being able to explain to the patient, hey, this is a new device and here is how this is going to feel a little bit different. Because for example, a cupola perimeter makes a slight noise, whereas this is a screen-based perimeter doesn't by definition. Um, so that's something that we do see on some patients. Um, and again, as you said, Jonathan, then just a little bit more tests are needed. Um, but we do find like a really good manager and not just saying, hey, dear patient, you know what to do. Here is the device, um, but really kind of help them a bit in the transition. It makes a huge difference, we find. Um, and maybe just getting back to your point, uh, Jonathan, on like, what do we compare? Um, I guess it's absolutely true. This is maybe a bit of a complicated uh, way of showing it, but let me just explain this slide a little bit. I mean, we all measure thresholds, right? And they are in influenced by all kinds of design characteristics. Um, so as you said, not different perimeters um, are slightly different. Um, what we find like they're much less different than they were 20 years ago, because now we really all use the same background illumination. Um, and a lot of things have become very standardized where, and there was more design differences in the past, but I think, a really good way to eliminate this um, is that um, you use a specific normative database for each device. So we have a normative database for the Octopus 900, we have one for the Octopus 600, we have one for the HFA. Um, and that eliminates a lot of these device specific differences and actually puts things on even ground. Um, and then all the things we look at, the comparisons, or uh, corrective comparisons with being the Humphrey word, total deviation and pattern deviation, um, they really turn out to be very comparable. And I think that's what we see in this data too, right? And the individual fluctuation is always higher than the variability brought into this by the, by the, pay, uh, by the device. So this brings us into a really good point with this visual here. 
related to the fact that the octopus perimeter runs on i9 software. It's our i suite software. Um, it's been completely revised. It's much more intuitive and user friendly. Um, so I would like for Monica to share her screen with us and give us kind of a tour of the new software. Do you mind doing that, Monica? Yes, um, very happy to do that. Um, I think that's a very important point because um, because it's still relatively new. Um, you may be used to working with uh, i8 software. I think that now there's an issue with getting, building up my screen. Let me, okay, here we go. I just needed to exit presentation mode. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really important to understand this slightly revised. Um, and if you would want to put this into an iSuite network, uh, you would need to update your whole network just to be aware um, but let me give you a little tour. Um, I mean, this is the standard screen of any octopus perimeter here or the patient that you can select. Here you open up. Um, what's new, you can just click on any field and always all fields open up. And one of the things that's new and I find quite nice um, is um, this navigation panel here where you can just switch back and forth between fields. Um, it seems to be that um, the, the capacity of Zoom is uh, making my suite a bit slow for whatever reason. Um, so we just take this a bit more slowly. Um, yeah, then here in the center, uh, that's what we call the viewing panel where you just would see the result. And the new feature that we have here is, um, you know, if you double click on any representation, you actually get um, both the exact definition uh, but also a little bit of an interpretation aid. Um, so you kind of like, so what is a white and an octopus or what's a black? Um, it, it just gives you a little bit of a reference. And then on the right hand side, we have the common views that we always had, a single eye view, uh, a left right eye view, uh, especially up for, for neuro cases, a four in one view that you can customize. What's new is the seven in one view, um, and again, always there are these pop-ups. So you always have this reference for self-educating yourself or, or of course for teaching. Um, there is this serious view, which is new. And uh, what's nice about it, you know, speak, getting back to transition, uh, here we see side by side any field. So even if you just have a macula field, it would show up here as a 10 degree field. And here, this is a, one of Jonathan's cases. Um, that's still Humphrey Field from 2008, and then that's the corresponding octopus one. So that's definitely a good view. Um, then well, we it have- It also shows you again, it becomes very yeah, sure. clear as you scroll across that, the patient's own variability. Uh, it's, it's not just a question of the, the machine switch, it's the patient's variability, which of course, it's not just that patients aren't perfect test takers, it's also that the disease has inherent variability to it. So increased testing when there's greater variability, I find very helpful. There was a question about the transfer that someone has put in the comments about Humphrey to octopus transfer. And they asked about what about non-I versions of the machine. And of course, we, we switched before the I versions even existed. And my understanding is that in most cases, the switch can be made there may be some ancient Humphrey machines where it proves impossible, but that's the exception is my understanding from the US experience. Is that right, Tanya? Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember whether the I version can be transferred or not. Um, it's, I think the question was about the non-I versions, yeah. Right. Monica, can you help me here? I know that the I version should should work uh, seamlessly. Uh, non I, um, I, I think it, it would be worth to look at this with tech support and really go through the database and see it. Um, that was a bit before my time, to be honest. Uh, the non I, um, but we, I mean, I, I I can't remember in my last seven years of a case where we not been able to do this. But I'm not in in the field as much. Uh, too right, so uh, I think I think it'd be best to, to look at this with tech support and uh, what's possible, and what isn't. And how do you work with the iSuite perimetry, Dr. Myers? So the iSuite perimetry, as I said, really 
this is, we've been so happy with this. The patients were happy with the octopus because they, they enjoyed the uh, quicker testing algorithm. We were happy with, as clinicians with the iSuite software. Additionally, we like when our patients are happy, but we were happy partly because of this view right here, which looks totally intimidating if you haven't seen it before often. But very quickly, looking at the bottom, you can see the left eye going from older to newer fields left to right, the right eye below that. Very quickly, you have a sense, is this patient stable or progressing? And then above it, you have a bunch of global indices. So MD, mean deviation, that's clear. And that's showing you the slope, both graphically and quantitatively, 1.1 decibels. And then next to that, you have the uh, SLV. And, and the secret here is to know that SLV, for those of you who are not perimetry PhDs, is almost the same as PSD. So it's your pattern deviation in the Humphrey world is very, very similar in how it behaves to the square of the loss variance SLV in the hog strike world. And so you can see that's a downward slope. You can see that the quantitates, quantifies, sorry, the slope at 0.7 decibels a year. And that open red triangle quickly focuses me that there's a less than 5% chance that this has occurred uh, just through random fluctuation. And on the right eye, just next to it, you can see the mean deviation is significant, uh, but the uh, SLV is not, so that would be more of a global depression, whereas the left eye looks more of focal progression. And I can look at this page, having seen a few patients now over the last 10 years having these fields, and looking at this is a very quick process to intuitively know how much I need to drill down. I go from here to something called the cluster analysis, which looks at averages of groups of points. So, for example, on the left-hand side of the slide, the OS, the left eye, you can see that there's this cluster nasally that says 3.1, and that's the nasal step cluster. It's the average of the nasal points, and it's looking at that average defect over time and telling me that that group of points is getting worse on average at three decibels a year, and that solid red downward triangle tells me that there is a less than 1% chance that this is random fluctuation, and that is super helpful for me because in, in so, so quickly, I can know in my mind how much I want to drill down and look at the serious fields or whether I'm certain this is a problem that needs to be addressed or whether I want to dig into those fields a little bit more with the serious view and see exactly which points are changing. And there are lots of ways to do that, but it, it makes it easier for me, whereas my prior methods of looking at fields actually took more work. And if I want to exclude a field because it's unreliable, it's frankly as simple as just right clicking on one of those fields and saying, hey, high false positives, we're dropping that one. Uh, and it will remember that now in the newer software, so it will keep that one out uh, until I tell it to put it back in. So it's not that I have to reinvent that wheel every time I see a patient. Is there a specific... The oh, may I, uh, Dr. Myers, uh, there's been quite some research um, saying that this is actually more sensitive to detect glaucoma progression, or it actually detects it earlier than both point-wise and global progression. Is this something that you see in your patients and your practice? So the, the, the really nice thing about the cluster analysis is that it's, it's very robust because it's doing a linear regression. It's taking into account how much things are changing and looking at the inherent variability of the testing versus the slope to tell me is that statistically significant. And so it, it's, it's both sensitive, but also has specificity because it doesn't call it out if it's not significant. Point-wise progression analysis, which we have done with the progressor and other software. Point-wise progression analysis sometimes suffers from slight fixation shifts. And these slight shifts can lead to uh, points being averaged or changing location. And so it can affect the algorithm and make it false positives and false negatives for progression. So we've been very happy with the performance of this, uh, not being overly sensitive and sending up a lot of fire drills, but giving us useful information. So you look, you're looking at this for every case or just occasionally? Uh, any patient who's got three or more fields, I will look at this. It's okay. the quickest way for me to know what more I need to drill down on. Uh, it's just so quick to get a sense of how things are doing for that patient. That's where the tech leaves for every patient. This is what the tech leaves up 
actually the, the other one, the global, the, the slide before that is what the tech leaves up. And for any, for most patients, I will just quickly click to the cluster view. Uh, I'd say 95 out of 100 patients. Yeah. And we do have another view, um, the polar trend view, um, which I'm pulling up right right now, um, which is also a kind of unique feature of the octopus. Um, let me just show you my screen. Can you see the video? Can you or can you not? You cannot. No. No. Okay, then I need to um, improve on my skills. So manipulating the Zoom. Um, so what about now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so here is the polar analysis. I'm, I'm hoping it's coming. Yeah. Um, and I show this video because it's very difficult to explain, but actually very easy to use. Um, what it does is it takes the local defects from the comparisons or total deviation chart and projects them along the nerve fibers onto the optic disc because we, of course, know the anatomical relationship, know where the fibers enter the disc. And then we draw this chart. Um, and the longer the bar, the larger the defect. And then we orient this like a structural result. So this one is really like a very quick, simple way of looking at kind of answering the question, where should I look for a structural defect to find correspondence? Uh, Dr. Myers, uh, can you explain a bit how that's useful in practice? So I think the many users find this useful two ways. The first way is that comparing this to an OCT is very intuitive because where you see the red and the length of the red here immediately corresponds to the areas you're looking at in the OCT. And, and so I think uh, looking at the RNFL view of the OCT and the TSNID analysis, uh, that comparison many users find useful. But even separate from that, just looking at this, once you're accustomed to this view, it's a very quick view as to you can tell where the defects are because the depth of the defect is as you get further out, it's a worse defect. And then you can tell how much the defect has changed by the length of the line. So this would be an example of a defect that's significant now and that has grown substantially over this interval. And so it's another way to very quickly encapsulate a lot of information once you're used to looking at this view. Uh, some people use it a lot, some people don't, but it's, it's a feature that, again, once you play with it a bit, you may find it very appealing to get a quick overview and look at the OCT at the same time. Right. And this may be one more new feature of the i3i9 software. That's for those involved in teaching. Um, we call this the perimetry interpretation aid, and it's really kind of a self-learning tool. Um, it, it's, it's the interpretation of uh, any selected field is kind of set up as a workflow just pointing to specific points of a full report, which may be overwhelming to a student in the first place, and just asking very specific questions. And that's not so exciting, confirm patient and examination parameters, but it kind of walks you through a visual field step by step. Uh, so assess reliability, artifacts and trustworthiness. Are false positive and negatives acceptable? That's a typical type of question. And I'm saying self-learning because it has this background information uh, if somebody needs it. So really allows, allows you to give a student a couple of fields that are already there in the software and just go through this workflow and kick, look at it like does the defer curve indicate diffuse loss and if you don't know what it does, you always get this background help. Um, so we do find, uh, we get a lot of positive feedback from students on this, that they can really play with it, but it kind of points to the right answers. That's just something I wanted to mention. Dr. Myers, mm -hmm. is there anything else you would like to share with us what you really like about your octopus? You know, it's just, it's been a very, we use it as a networked environment and it's, we've, we've had, so few problems with either any instrument or with the database and networking of iSuite software across the instruments in the last 10 years. It's just been remarkable. Uh, in an era where computers make or break your life, uh, the dependability of this has been great. And the Hogstripe team has been a pleasure to work with, very much open to 
both our needs and also suggestions. And, and we've worked together and talked over the years about things that could be added. And, and many of the things we've talked about are, are in this software now. So it's really been a, a great relationship. Um, I do want to take a moment and address, yeah, um, there are a couple of questions that have floated up that are good questions about aspects of the software, the cluster trend analysis and corrected cluster trend that may be a little bit beyond the time we have. But I do want to say that taking into account the global depression by subtracting out global depression, looking at corrected cluster trend um, is, is, is something you can do, but how much you wish to do that will depend on which algorithm you're using for your perimetry and some other subtleties that we could talk about all day offline. It would be, would be great fun. I'm always interested in this stuff, but probably we don't have time for right here. And the other thing I do want to touch on is somebody brought up UV sterilization, and there are people doing UV sterilization inside their cupolas, but these, uh, my understanding is that these uh, uh, materials really are, not, these plastic type materials are not designed for, or proven with UV light and ozone exposure repeatedly. And so it may be effective, but it may also be effective at prematurely aging your perimetry no matter who made it. Uh, so I'm not sure I'd recommend that personally. Monica, do you want to chime in on that? Yes. Um, so we, we've been looking at this, um, and it's not part of our instructions for disinfection. One being the reason that um, it's not so readily available. Um, the other one, uh, us not knowing exactly where's the upper limit on how much UV light you can put on this. But what we what we know, I mean, you know, which parts of an octopus perimeter are sensitive to UV light and it would be the paint coating the inside of the cupola. And uh, we check back on the specifications and that paint's been designed to be used in high altitude Swiss mountains or any altitude. There's actually quite a high load of UV light. Huh. Having said that, I mean, I'm sure there's a lamp that can do more than just alpine UV light. And that's why we help back from that. Um, in terms of plastics, um, Inside cupola, there's not really any part. I mean, it's really that paint, um, the mirrors, um, or the IR light. Uh, we don't think they're sensitive to to UV light. Um, but yeah, we just don't know exactly what kind of dosage we can recommend. Um, so that's why we really think that um, this should be left up to people more knowledgeable than us, um, because I think they're. Dr. Mais, you tell me if you disagree, but I think there are established protocols on on how you disinfect surfaces in a medical environment. Um, and I would just refer to that. I mean, we know that uh, isopropanol works 70%. Um, one thing that's also important, make sure that whatever you use um, only contains the agent and water and no kind of additional flavoring because there's really a risk of leaving a stain. We want something that fully evaporates um, after we sprayed it. And there is a question on how to atomize, whether we recommend the device. I mean, there's so many out there and different countries have different solutions and different supplies. So we not recommended one specifically, but uh, try to get one with kind of makes it really small droplets. Like the smaller, Fine. the more misty, the better. Fine mist makes sense, yeah. Um, then there's some advice uh, I'd like to share on the fogging of the lenses. Um, somebody suggests, uh, Paul Jean, that we can heat them, keep them in a heated container um, so they're warmer. I think that's a very good piece of advice. Um, just adding a glass frame adjustment heater with silica beads. Um, Then there's a question on how often should we do the alcohol misting if somebody wears a mask? And that's a very good question. Dr. Myers, what do you think? Yeah, so, you know, this is all preventive and we really don't know how much of an issue this is. Um, good air circulation in the room is a good idea just for all of us. Um, I'd say that, it, you know, there are people who are probably on this call who have a community incidence of COVID of one in a thousand in terms of the, uh, the, not the incidence, but the prevalence. And there are people in New York City where they think it may be 20% of people have been infected. 
and there may be very different numbers who are in an asymptomatic infection, infective stage or are asymptomatic carriers at any given time. So it's very hard to know what makes sense. In general, in medicine, if we think there's a risk to a patient, we disinfect between every patient. Um, and then we're certainly at Will's Eye Hospital trying to disinfect every instrument that a patient actually touches or is in contact with uh, between every patient in a really rigorous way these days. Uh, that's our approach. But I just want to acknowledge that there's not a lot of science available to us to know for certain what makes sense. Yes, and I think that's been the whole challenge here, right? Um, and we all would love to be very specific, but it's kind of a challenge. Um, there's a question on whether is there's any area of the machine that we should avoid when cleaning. Um, no, not really. Um, I, just make sure that you really don't bet and, and that you just missed. I, I think that that's the kind of thing. I mean, obviously if there's too much liquid, um, then it can kind of go into the electronics. The, the major project, projector on the octopus is actually on, on the top and not on the bottom. So um, there shouldn't be too much kind of going into that one, but you know, just to be on the safe side. It's on the top on the inside above. Yes. So it's actually yes. hard to get to to spray. So you'd be hard pressed. You'd have to be trying to get that too wet. Yes. Uh, well, and there's a question on was spraying the cleaner inside this color, the surface. Um, I mean, we haven't been able to be very honest. We haven't been able to do this a thousand times and kind of adjust, look at what the surface does. Our assumption is, um, I mean, the, the paint on the surface is, um, should be resistant to that. Um, but I think what's really important is just alcohol water and not any kind of fragments or any anything, anything, um, because there we really don't know. Um, but I, th I think it's, it's really about, I think there's no perfect solution out there. We've been really trying. Um, and, and so have our competitors, right, to come up with, with a way at least. Um, but clearly be really careful um, and, and try to avoid touching the inside of the cupola. I think that's what I can recommend because, you know, if the alcohol may dissolve a little bit of the surface and you start rubbing, um, that can be an issue. Looks like there's a chat question here <clears throat> about the eye tracking camera and whether or not it should be misted as well. Uh, we looked at this and um, we don't think it's an issue if you if you do. Our competitors on their design think differently. Uh, we know that, but um, the way our device is built, um, we don't see an issue. Um, Some there are I'm seeing a couple of questions on capabilities of the 600, whether it does a size five, uh, whether it does uh, customized tests, you know, like the, a lot of the features of the 900 and, and no, it doesn't. It doesn't do a size five. Um, major reason is there's a limit to the illumination of the background screen and a very low vision. We have to use a Goldman equivalent. So we have to enlarge the stimuli bit and now with a size five, that gets too much. So at the very low vision end um, of testing, probably still be useful to use your cupola perimeter. And um, custom test features, you cannot use. Uh, gate strategy was a question as well. Uh, you cannot use. Um, these are really like kind of specific to the Octopus 900. So I see that there's um, quite a few other questions here. Um, most of them we've we've already covered. One that I saw is, um, uh, and maybe perhaps you might have already touched on it, but the difference between comparing the G programming to the 24-2, um, 
to understand that the 24-2 working only with faster strategy is not a good thing. So can you give a comparison of the G program to the 30, or I'm sorry, to the 24-2 and why you would use that G program? So uh, we like the G, so the, the, uh, I think we're talking about a couple different things here. Um, there's the G strategy, which, which is a roughly radially oriented distribution of points. It has many more points in the center, plus or minus 10 degrees than a standard 24-2 field, and a little less dense points out in the periphery. And so you're more likely with that one test to pick up paracentral defects than with the 24-2. Um, and that's the G program. The 24-2C has some extra points placed within the center 10 degrees um, in places that are at a slightly greater likelihood to develop a paracentral defect in at least one uh, database. Um, so uh, Jeff Liebman and others have done some great work uh, highlighting that many patients will have paracentral defects earlier than we might think. And so having these algorithms available to us that have more central testing points than a standard 24-2 is of great appeal. Um, so that's the, the spatial distribution of points. And then there's a whole nother discussion about the thresholding algorithm, CETA, CETA fast, CETA faster, and dynamic versus top tendency-oriented perimetry. Um, we, in our practice, feel that tendency-oriented perimetry, because the patients, uh, have a more positive experience. It's a much shorter test and easier for the patient. We, we feel that the benefits of that outweigh the slight loss in spatial uh, distribution information of the defects. You get slightly broader, less deep defects with the top strategy than the CETA standard, the CETA strategy, which tends to sharpen and deepen defects compared to our original uh, standard and uh, fast pack strategies that we were used to in the 90s. Uh, but there's a whole big discussion that we could have for the next hour about the pros and cons of each of these. And I think that different people will come down on different sides. And it's just because it depends which aspects and, and strengths and weaknesses that you particularly value. But uh, it's always good to talk about perimetry and these different uh, considerations. They're all good choices. Uh, again, we tend to like the GTOP because of those combinations of features for most but not all of our patients. Maybe, maybe quickly adding to the hop versus dynamic discussion that um, I often come across. And um, I think when looking at all the literature and knowing the strategies as they are, I think it boils down to a couple of things. Um, as you said, it's really easy for the patient, mainly because it starts um, very superficial. So it's very bright in the beginning, and that really helps people to understand what they're supposed to do. And it only gets hard towards the end of the test, where if any of these other threshold tests really start close to, close to normal vision, so very dim, and that gets very hard. Um, on the other hand, on the pure, if, I mean, if you do a pure mathematical simulation, as you mentioned, it tends to shallow out small isolated defects and that can be a disadvantage. And I think it really boils down to, um, because there's some studies saying top is actually more accurate and some saying dynamic is. Um, and I think it really boils down to um, how capable is a patient of performing well in perimetry. And the more capable the patient, and the more likely the dynamic is more accurate and the more a patient struggles with parametry tests, the more likely a patient is accurate on top. And I think that's explaining the contradictory results of the various studies. There are 20 out there, and there, some of them think the one is better and some think the other is better. I just wanted to mention for anybody who needs further explanation or has um, further questions, we're happy to um, kind of take this offline we're happy to help you individually as more questions arise. So here in the chat, I'm just going to type in some information for you all. If you want to copy down my email address, I'm happy to field those questions. Of course, if you're out of the United States and you email me questions, I'm happy to get those over to the appropriate person uh, for you as well. Um, Monica or Dr. Myers, did you have anything else to add here today? 
just adding to the quad numbers, um, international participants, uh, if you want to have any more information on the Octopus or the Octopus 600, um, please contact your local Hawkstride distributor um, and they'll be happy to give you all the answers. I just want to say thank you uh, to Hogstrike for inviting me to talk about Brimetree, something I'm passionate about, and thank you for your support over the years. And I appreciate everyone taking the time on a Thursday afternoon to uh, join the discussion of uh, what we're doing these days, given the COVID challenge. Thank you. Well, yeah. thank you on my side. I'll thank you, Dr. Myers, Tanya, for putting this together. I think we're in a time of uncertainty. We try to share what we know um, and also what we don't know. We have to be honest about that. Um, I thank you all for your time and wish you a safe time onwards and this new normal, as we call it. Yes, thanks, Dr. Myers. Thank Monica. Thanks, Monica. And thanks for everybody who took the time out of their day to jump on and listen to us. We appreciate it and happy to help with anything further. You just want to send me an email. Thank you. Well, thank you.